Um, maybe we could look at the um, at a video to show some of the backdrop that we have. This is a report that we have looking at, at the backdrop to this uh, to this visit. Change through trade. For years, that was Germany's China policy. Former Chancellor Angela Merkel championed the idea throughout her 16 years in power, suggesting that making money and fostering change go hand in hand. China is now Germany's biggest trade partner, and concerns are growing that this has made Germany dangerously dependent. If you look at a couple of the kind of key clusters of dependency, um, we're now particularly down to parts of the car, um, the auto sector and the chemical sector. And I, and I think that's where you have the real dependencies. China, under all-powerful President Xi Jinping, has undergone profound change. The economy has reached new heights, but instead of opening up politically, Xi has doubled down on authoritarianism. The idea of change through trade looks dead. Yet the new government has been wrestling with what to do about that. The coalition deal the government signed last year looked tough, with passages on Taiwan and human rights. A hallmark of the Green Party, which holds important ministries in the government. The time when people said trade, no matter what, no matter what the social and humanitarian standards are, this is the point of all relations. This is something we shouldn't allow ourselves any longer. This means that we will also establish a more robust trade policy vis-à-vis -vis China for Europe. But the man at the top doesn't seem so sure. Chancellor Olaf Scholz has pushed through a controversial deal allowing a Chinese state enterprise to buy a stake in Germany's most important port, Hamburg. The decision was met with uproar from his own coalition partners, most notably from the Greens. Olaf Scholz's decision now to travel to China with a business delegation is only adding to the divisions. So where does that leave Germany's China strategy? Germany will not just look, have to look at how to diversify economic relations, but actually how to reduce strategic dependencies on China particularly in critical areas such as raw materials uh, and, for example, areas such as uh, wind turbines, uh, solar uh, modules and uh, electric uh, batteries for electric vehicles. Crucial decisions lie ahead, but it's not clear if the German government can make up its mind. And you're watching DW News. I'm here with Clifford Kuhner, now China expert. Following this visit by the Chancellor, the first uh, leader here in the European Union to visit China since the pandemic and since the war in Ukraine, China has uh, positioned itself uh, quite strategically in, in that case, uh, more behind Russia, but hasn't come out uh, to say that in, in those words. Uh, but we do see uh, a supportive uh, partnership there developing between Russia and China. Uh, the partnership we're looking at today is that of Germany and uh, China, Europe's largest economy, and China being its uh, most important trading partner, which does cause uh, quite some friction on political levels here in Berlin, that's for sure. Um, Clifford, can you tell me a little bit more about how Germany wants to move ahead with its relationship uh, with China, considering the huge business ramifications there. I mean, business leaders have told me time and again, there is only one China. Yeah. I think, I think this is something, thinking back in this, looking the back <clears throat> on the last couple of years, where we had effectively very, very little tri trade between Germany and China, between China and anyone, because the country was basically locked down so much, um, supply chains were seizing up because of the COVID pandemic. In many ways, you think that would be a great opportunity to start thinking, really thinking about your China policy, because um, it's not so much even the idea of doing business with China that's problematic. Um, what we've seen in Germany is seems to be this rush to create dependencies. It, it has this dependency on, on Russian energy, which is problematic, and, and, and now it has this dependency on selling um, Volkswagens and um, chemicals to China as well. It's, it's, it, it seems to be all or nothing, mm -hmm. and, and there seems to be quite short-term thinking in terms of... Um, 
in terms of diversifying. You know, any any business manager knows that it's good to 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 uh, to diversify your options, and and that sort of thinking doesn't seem to have happened. And and I'm asking myself why why that that hasn't happened. Um, at the same time, it's a very attractive market. It's a huge market, 1.4 billion people. It's very hard to say no, um, and it's a very demanding market. Um, a lot of the you know when when BASF or when uh, VW go in there, they want access to quite a lot of the technology, for example, that's, that, that these companies have to offer, because uh, ultimately they want to make it themselves. They don't want a German company to be making it, they want a Chinese company to be making it. Uh, so against this backdrop, you would think you would have second, if not second thoughts, you would be thinking more strategically and more long-term about it, and I don't really see too much of that going on. Um, tell me more about the corporate executives on this trip, because there's been COVID chaos unfolding at, at this mega factory, for example, that assembles iPhones, and surely that would set off alarm bells to the uh, business executives of BASF, the chemicals company you were referring to, and uh, also the auto giants and other industrial grades. Absolutely. I mean, the optics of that have been have been disastrous. I mean, this is the biggest manufacturer of, of iPhones in the world, the Taiwanese company Foxconn uh, in Zhengzhou, the most heavily populated uh, in, in Henan province, most heavily populated part of China. So in some ways, the most typical part of China. Um, and you've seen these scenes of people with their uh, pulling along their suitcases and wearing their Apple backpacks, um, being confronted by police and uh, by officials in hazmat suits who won't let them leave, even though they're trying to escape quarantine. Um, it shows that the, the working environment in China still has a way to go. And if part of your requirements as a corporate are that you, you treat your subsidiaries um, according to international labour laws, for example, uh, you can sort of see a lot of problems developing there. Also, even just securing your supply chain seems to be very, very difficult because people clearly vote with their feet. And China is not obviously unusual in that, but the structures there are so rigid that it doesn't seem to be that, that this is a possibility. But that's been the problem for so many years now uh, that... Western companies aren't treated the same way that Chinese companies are treated then abroad. Yeah, there's, there's always been a way of sort of, I mean, outsourcing has always worked that, um, you know, there's been a lot of looking away with, with outsourcing. And that's becoming less and less possible, I think, be, um, as, as these companies, as Chinese companies and in, in other developing markets, as they become more sophisticated, for example, they demand to have the same, Chinese workers want to have the same rights as, as European workers. Um, this is something that's, uh, that's going to happen at some point um, and it's going to have to be dealt with at a government level both by both in China and also by the by Germany and the US and and uh, we're going to see it in so many different sectors the world the world is changing that way and and, and the days of cheap production um, and looking going from cheap production venue to another is, seem to be changing well let's see if we see uh, any hints of change uh, while we wait for this press conference uh, to set up uh, where we're expecting Li Keqiang, the current premier, uh, to uh, talk to the press any moment. Uh, you've described him as a, as a lame duck mm. premier. He's soon to be outgoing premier uh, in the next few months. But he has played an important part in the economy, hasn't he? He has. He's always, Li Keqiang has always been seen as the, as the, the economic the, the man who manages the economy. Um, and in some ways, he's been seen as a much more approachable figure internationally. Um, he speaks good English. He's, he's got an international perspective, whereas uh, Xi's focus has always been very inward, very party-focused. Um, the economy is now slowing down, so quickly yeah. in comparison to past decades. Exactly. And um, we saw this recently with Jörg Wutke, who's the BASF mm -hmm. China head, who is also head of the European Chamber of Commerce. And he says that how ideology is trumping the economy. And that's something that you can almost see that in, in the fact that Li Keqiang, the, you know, the economy czar, is being pushed out in favour of Li Qiang, who is a close ally of, um, of Li Keqiang. And he will be coming in sometime in the next couple of months. And um, what we're seeing now is a very ideological focus in China. Things are becoming very, very political. I mean, they always were. But um, the idea where that maybe the, the party will hold back on certain actions or maybe introduce reforms, um, a lot of those, those debates seem to be gone now. The focus is just so ideological and on, on Xi entrenching power at the heart of the Communist Party espousing this idea of... We, we've always spoken about um, socialism with Chinese 
capitalism with Chinese car, uh, characteristics or socialism with Chinese characteristics, what we're seeing now is a focus a bit more on the socialism than on the capitalism. It sounds like a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> when, uh, we're, we're just uh, going to tune in now mm -hmm. to hear from both German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. <laughs> So the journalists are just being told to put on their headphones for the translation. Hopefully we'll get a translation to in a second from Li Keqiang. Guten Tag, liebe Journalistinnen und Journalisten. Die Pressekonferenz vom Premierminister Li Keqiang und Bundeskanzler Scholz beginnt jetzt. Zuerst wird Ministerpräsident Li Keqiang ein Statement abgeben. Chancellor Scholz will begin to begin with Premier Li Keqiang. We'll take the floor. Sehr geehrter Herr Bundeskanzler Scholz, Chancellor Scholz, Journalists, Ladies and Gentlemen, I wish you all a very good day. It is a great pleasure for me to come and speak to you today in the company of Chancellor Scholz. To begin with, once again, on behalf of the Chinese government, I would like to welcome you, Chancellor Scholz, to China and to congratulate you on your journey. A very warm welcome to you. It is your first visit to China as German Chancellor. Our diplomatic relations have continued now for many decades. A very warm welcome then to China. We had an official conversation which took place in an open, honest, fact-based atmosphere. We both shared the view that China and Germany are both major economies in today's world. Geographically, we may be far apart at other ends of the Eurasian continent. So there's a huge geographic distance, but our ties and the cooperation between China and Germany is continuing to improve and bearing rich fruits as well. The ties between China and Germany remain important, and there's a lot of common ground and a great deal of potential for our cooperation. We know that the international situation is very serious and is very complex and challenging in many different ways. In some issues, it is also fraught with risk. Against this background, we need to have a relationship between Germany and China which is sound and stable. And that can send a signal to the world that we are pursuing multilateralism. We support a multipolar world. We are both interested in pursuing free trade, and we want to meet our partners on an equal footing on the basis of cooperation. We want to ensure that our relations continue to be stable. This is helpful for the world economy as well, which is very unstable in other ways, and there are various different challenges involved. In doing so, we can create a better world. Our cooperation is pursuing stability and world peace, and it will contribute to both. Pragmatic cooperation between China and Germany and a discussion of the issues that we have to address were talked about at length. 
in particularly in particular regarding trade. These are issues that are the basis of our contact, but we also touched on major projects that are important. The German side has its own issues that it presented to the Chinese side, and the Chinese side also had its own issues. And we talked about German products on the Chinese market and that we continue to be prepared to assist Germany in accessing our markets. And we are doing this specifically very much in the hope of seeing an opening of both countries towards one another. China is pursuing a peaceful path and is pursuing opening of its political approach. The Chinese modernization must also serve the prosperity of the Chinese people as a whole. China and Germany have cooperated in many different areas. Investment, for example, and this is very promising. We discussed these issues at length with one another in person, and both sides agreed that we need to have the necessary resoluteness to make progress with our projects. China and Germany bear a responsibility for the entire world, a world currently fraught with so many problems in terms of grain supply and energy. China is a big country with 1.4 billion inhabitants. We need to be able to guarantee that we have an autonomous grain supply. And we want to also supply many other countries with Chinese grain. We very much hope that the world grain market stabilizes, and we hope that the international energy supply market also becomes more stable. Because if not, it will be very damaging for the economies, not just of our countries, but of the world. And for this reason, China is trying to not only unfold our own potential and our own grain supply, in a sense, we are also trying to contribute to stability in the grain market. We discussed with the German side as well the issue of climate change, particularly regarding climate change. We very much commit to our responsibility as an emerging economy and both of our countries are very much aware of our responsibility towards preventing climate change, and we discussed areas of cooperation. We talked about establishing a mechanism between Germany and China to tackle the climate change problems facing us. We had talked about other issues in depth as well and exchanged opinions. For example, we talked about the current Ukraine crisis. Both of us very much hope that this crisis ends soon. We cannot afford any further escalation of this crisis, and we very much hope that we can move the parties involved to peace talks. We do not want the stability of the region and indeed of the world as a whole to be shaken by this crisis any further. 
we do not want the international production and supply chains to be disrupted any further either or even destroyed. We do not want to see this. We want to see a peaceful world and regional stability in this area. But you know that Germany and China also have many differences in terms of culture, history, and social systems. So naturally, we had different views. We had controversies as well in our discussions, which can hardly be avoided. But we spoke very frankly on these points. We both shared the view. Well, the Chinese side is of the view that the international community should preserve its values of freedom, democracy, equality, and development. These are values that China can share as well. And all of humanity shares these universal values. And therefore, we should be kind with one another. And naturally, we know that there are certain issues where we differ. But on the other hand, there are controversies there as well that are better spoken about openly. The problems that are controversial should be discussed frankly, and we should look at common ground, for example, when it comes to finding compromises with our differences. We will continue with the reform and opening of China and would like to have a more internationally compatible environment based on the rule of law also for our commercial activities so that China can remain a, an attractive investment location. Together we want to work together towards prosperity and development of humanity and for world peace and we, I have proposed a further appointment with Mr. Scholz to meet captains of industry in Germany, from Germany and China. We are prepared to take any questions you may have as well, and we hope that we can find solutions for the problems in this world today. Chancellor Scholz, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, it is good and right that I'm here in Beijing today. We had intense debates at length, first with President Xi and now with Premier Li. This is my first visit as Chancellor of Germany, visiting China. While well, we had had video conferences as well with both President Xi and Premier Li, but we have also met before, we have only managed to communicate with one another with Premier Li virtually. This is our first time to meet in person. In person. Of course, my visit occurs at a time where the world is racked with conflict and crises, a time where it is more important than ever to speak with one another and to exchange views. The Russian attack on Ukraine has brought war back to Europe with its attack on a sovereign neighboring state. President Putin is not just infringing brutally on international law, but he is also questioning our security order as well. This has also generated a huge hike in prices for energy and for grain, and this impacts most harshly on poor countries. China is an important country. As a member of the Security Council of the UN, China also has a responsibility for peace in the world. I have said to President Xi that it's important that China exert its influence on Russia. It is about the principles of the UN Charter that we have all agreed on and asserting these principles like sovereignty and territorial integrity of every country. These are important issues for China as well. Russia must stop its attacks on Ukraine that cause such suffering on the civilian population in Ukraine and withdraw from Ukraine's borders. We have agreed that threatening nuclear attacks is irresponsible and dangerous in using nuclear weapons 
Putin would be crossing a line. We have seen that the majority of international communities, uh, international countries reject the referendum, or pseudo-referendum, I should call it, that Putin has conducted. Another challenge that we're facing is the pandemic. Since nearly three years, the COVID-19 pandemic has had the world in its grips and has crossed all borders. The COVID-19 pandemic has triggered problems all over. In Germany, one of the most effective vaccines to combat the pandemic was developed, and with this vaccine, we've created a basis to ease the massive restrictions on our everyday lives. The differences in German and Chinese policy for combating COVID-19 differs very much, but we are both taking on responsibility to ease the impact of the pandemic on the world. I talked with the Premier and the President about working more closely together. This would mean allowing BioNTech for expats in China and approving it within China. This would only be a first step, but I hope that the circle of those entitled to use it will increase to the point that BioNTech will be available for anyone who wants it in China. We have also talked about an approval of BioNTech with the association responsible for this decision in China. This would contribute to combating the pandemic. We also agreed in exchange with experts in medicine to coordinate between the Robert Koch Institute and the Chinese Institute responsible for combating the pandemic. My visit, which is my first visit here, occurs when we are celebrating 50 years of ties between China and Germany. In this half a century, our bilateral relations have intensified. This is particularly true in the area of trade. But we also have to say that the economic exchange with China recently has become more difficult for Germany. This is true for the access of the market, which is very open from a European side, whereas China is closing its markets in certain areas. It's also about difficulties that lead to problems with economic ties. And we are seeing discussions in China tending more towards autonomy and less towards economic ties. And these views are ones that need discussing. We talked openly and frankly. I said to my hosts that it's very important that we speak on an equal footing. We support it when German and Chinese economic partners pursue their own ends. What's important is that economic ties against European member states affect all of the EU, and we cannot accept this. The world is facing a number of crises that can only be solved together with Europe, China, the US, and other major players. And for that, we need a partnership between our countries. This is particularly true when it comes to combating climate change, pushing for biodiversity, food security, and world sovereign debt. The way that China deals with the environment is significant because it is such a large country and so populous. We want to support China to ensure that it is ambitious in its goals for, to combat climate change. We want to increase our cooperation between German and Chinese climate change policies, and we want to agree on this at a meeting next year in order to achieve success in this area. And we've also agreed that we want to have a transformation dialogue that we set up and establish. Obviously, the loss of global biodiversity threatens our lives. Worldwide, more than 35,000 flora and fauna species are threatened by extinction. Germany and China have committed to an ambitious agreement that combats the loss of biodiversity and stops it by 2030. We have also talked about 
approaching the member states involved and asking them to push for biodiversity and to be ambitious in their goals to stop the loss of biodiversity. More than 700 million people suffered from starvation across the, the world because of Russia's attack on Ukraine. The food security system has become worse. Grain supplies didn't come at all or came very late. I would like to call for the Russian president not to refuse to extend the grain deal. Starvation cannot become a weapon in war. Within the framework of our G7 presidency, Germany has created an alliance for world security, and I have asked the president of China to get involved in this as well, to combat starvation. The situation in the poorest countries in the world is becoming worse and worse through the pandemic and sovereign debt is increasing. Germany and China as international lenders are particularly responsible for combating starvation in this way. And we have said that particularly debt indebted countries in the global south will get advice from our experts. So as you see, there are a number of different issues where cooperation between Germany, Europe, and China can improve things. It is important that we continue with personal contacts from face to face after the interruption caused by the pandemic. Meeting in person, as our talks today, are a better context for discussing difficult issues. Today, I talked about our concern about stability and peace in the region. China has a particular responsibility here. As the US and Europe, we are also pursuing a China policy. But I've also said that changing the status quo of Taiwan can only take place in mutual agreement and peacefully. In, when we talked about human rights, I said it is clear that human rights are universal in their validity. This is true for individual rights of liberty as well as for social and cultural rights. And it's particularly true for the protection of the rights of minorities. All UN members have committed to these rights. And reminding these commitments and referring to the province of Xi'an, just reminding of these commitments is not an interference in domestic policy. There are differences. As the Premier has already said, we had our differences. It was important for me to show what our views were. But as difficult as the conversation can be, we want to remain in dialogue with one another. Reliability and trust are values that are important in both of our cultures. At the same time, they are the basis for diplomatic rights, political partnerships, and dialogue. The global crises of our very connected world make one thing sure. We are so interlaced that a virus from the other end of the world can massively impact people at the far end of the world. The pandemic has shown once again that the major challenges that our countries are facing the entire world indeed is facing, can only be overcome if we work together. And to make that clear, and also to encourage us all to make our own contribution is why I came to Beijing today. Okay, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz there we are addressing now concluding the media the after press. his talks with Li Keqiang, the current Premier of China, and also his talks earlier today with President Xi Jinping. Uh, in the studio with me is our China expert Clifford Kunin to talk about the highlights of that press conference. Um, and I guess we have to start with Russia. Uh, Russia did not come out, the word did not come out of the mouth of Li Keqiang, but uh, it is certainly something Olaf Scholz mentioned and touched on there um, in response to China's responsibility in global stability. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting to see the two different, uh, you know, you've got the same event, which is the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and then you've got these two completely different perspectives on it. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about China's tacit approval and tacit support for Russia, 
but it's a very, um, it's quite strong tacit support because they didn't mention, uh, Li Keqiang didn't mention the word Russia. Um, he talked about two parties as if, as if this was a, you know, as if Russia hadn't invaded uh, the Ukraine mm -hmm. and um, and talks about peace talks as if this was something that they could set, you know, when in, when in fact things are very, very different. This is an invasion and this is a country fighting for its life. And peace talks are the last thing Ukraine wants. Because yes. Because it's trying to defend its territory and doesn't want to give it up. Absolutely, absolutely. So that was very, very strong, I thought. And, um, and, and Scholz came out very strongly saying that this is about Russia's attack on Ukraine, a brutal infringement of international law. Um, he really goes after Russia. He accuses them of, of, of irresponsible use of th nuclear threats. Um, and so it does suggest that, whatever, that the talks that they, that they had were, were actually quite heated because this is, he, you know, did lay out, very much lay out the... Um, the, the German, or sorry, the Western position on, on Russia. Both said that the talks were lengthy and contentious. Mm. Um, so I'm sure there has been some wrangling going on there behind the scenes. Uh, but again, Li Keqiang did not utter the word Taiwan either, mm. uh, which Mr. Scholz did bring up. So uh, the German Chancellor is tackling big issues here that uh, other European leaders, the US as well, uh, has been wanting him to touch on, uh, although they were some of them against this visit in the first place. Well, in, in every in every visit by a major head of state to China that I covered in the years that I lived there, and and subsequently, there's always been a mention of that uh, such and such agreed to honour to respect the one China uh, policy on Taiwan, um, and that didn't come from the Chinese side. This. This, this time we heard nothing, as you mentioned. But what we did have was, was Olaf Scholz saying that if there's going to be any change in the status quo, it can only happen through, um, you know, basically he's warning China off any kind of invasion, saying that the, the international community will not tolerate it. And I think in some ways that's, that's, a, that's a step forward in some ways. Um, you know, I, th I think that's a very important development, the fact that the Chinese didn't mention it and that he mentioned it in much more aggressive terms, actually. At the same time, Li Keqiang made a big thing of China uh, holding the same values of freedom and democracy as the rest of the world. Mm. Um, it's, it's really interesting to always hear what the Chinese are putting out there, but what they are actually doing behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, this idea, China's always mentioning about democracy, how it supports democracy, when it, it doesn't. In fact, China has actually just become less democratic by introducing a third term for, it's moved, it take, taken a step much further closer to, di to full on dictatorship with the appointment of, uh, of Xi Jinping for a third term and, and effectively leader for life if he, if he chooses. So um, they put the, the, the idea that China is a peaceful player and everything, that message is out there. But China is very much about its own interests and it's, um, you know, there was a lot of, there was an aggressive undertone to quite a lot of what China was saying, uh, of what Li Keqiang was saying about China. And I think that that aggressive undertone is basically the way the world has changed, that, that, that China is now, it's the second biggest economy in the world. And it's also uh, diplomatically and politically, it's a much, much more important uh, force than it was 10 years ago even. And Li Keqiang is the economy czar, as you pointed out. Uh, he said that uh, both these huge economies, Germany and China, are geographically far apart, but that their ties and cooperation continue to improve and bear rich fruits. Wh who's plucking those rich fruits? Well, this is, again, short-term versus long-term. I think that, that certainly short-term Germany, German companies are doing very, will do very well out of this. Uh, if you, one interesting thing is on the delegation that traveled, uh, the, the German BDI, they did the, which is the Confederation of German Industry, which represents the medium-sized firms, they're much more skeptical about doing business with China because they fear having all their technology taken and about basically China taking over what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think that there's going to be a, a bit of a rethink in, in, in Germany about, about these issues. And just to say one thing about climate change as well, um, there was quite a lot of mentions. That's politically important for, for Schultz, of course, but um, China dangles cl climate change. It's effectively weaponized climate change because it knows that it's the biggest polluter in the world now and that um, the world needs China in order for uh, 
climate change goals to be achieved. But at the same time, Li Keqiang did point out uh, that China is an emerging economy when it talked about when he talked about its responsibility, which of course means, hey guys, uh, we can get away with a lot more than the international community would like. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's something that, you know, that, that was very clear and it's something going forward, they're going to have other meetings about this, but China is always going to play the fact, as you say, we're a developing market. So very, very interesting points. Clever Coonan, thank you very much for the analysis. Well, let's take a look at some more top stories from around the world today. Twitter has started laying off staff in a move. Its new owner billionaire Elon Musk hopes will make the platform more profitable. The company did not give a specific number, but US media reports show that half of Twitter's 7,500 employees could be let go.